Dr. MacArthur, thank you for joining us for this edition of the G3 podcast. My pleasure. Uh, I know that you have greatly impacted me, and I can speak on behalf of many others to say thank you for your faithfulness through the years. Well, thank you, Josh. It's, uh, it's an amazing journey to do this for as long as I have and see the grace that is continually extended mm-hmm. to me to be able to keep preaching the Word of God, and no, no greater joy for me. Yeah. As I think about your influence on me personally, I think there's two reasons as I think back to why it is I've been so attracted to your ministry through the years is because of your rigid faithfulness to the text of Scripture, that it's not based upon the cultural climate of the day, but you're you're very much committed to the text of Scripture. And then also your willingness to take unpopular stands to defend the gospel. And that's been a huge encouragement to me. So... I, want, I just want to encourage you to continue to persevere onward. <laughs> well, we know the gospel is an offense. So if you're given the gospel the way the gospel is laid out in Scripture, you have to offend. Uh, I, I did an interview recently, and somebody said to me, does it bother you that you offend so many people? And I said, no, my job is to offend as many people as possible with the offense of their sinfulness. Jesus said, um, you hate me because I tell you, your deeds are evil. But that's where the gospel has to start. Mm-hmm. So we, we have to identify sin, we have to identify false doctrine, and um, that's part of the calling. Yeah, absolutely. So here you are, uh, f- you know, you've been pastoring the same church, Grace Community Church, more than 50 years. Uh, you've been through various seasons, seasons of blessing, seasons of pain, weddings, funerals, the whole bit. So here you are at this particular time. Uh, what's one of the greatest blessings now, presently, after having served for more than 50 years in the same church that you enjoy today? Well, when you use the word seasons, uh, I think immediately of Second Timothy 4, preach the word in season and out of season. And I think that means that we, we exposit Scripture with a view to the season. In season and out of season means that times and epochs will ebb and flow, and the Word of God has to be accommodated to those kinds of issues, whatever happens to be going on. And as I look back over half a century and see sequential exposition of books and books and books and books for all these many years, I also see how through all kinds of various seasons in that half a century, the Word of God was directed in a special way at what was happening. Um, in this particular season now, obviously, we have some current issues that are massive and epic and inescapable, and you'd have to have your head in the sand not to be addressing them from the Word of God. So the wonderful reality is to be in a season as this complicated one is. I mean, there's never been as complicated a season as there is now with all of the issues related to health and covid and then all the racial issues and all the social issues and all the educational issues and just, you know, police issues. I mean, it's just a, it's a cacophony of, of uh, noise that disrupts life in, in just about every way you can imagine. And then the breakdown of the family and all the rest that's going on, political hatreds. And so the thing that's so encouraging to me is that I, I'm not confused. And I think and after all these years, I'm... It all looks pretty clear to me because half a century of seeing everything through the lens of Scripture allows me to understand what's happening in the world, both from the human standpoint and even from God's sovereignty. So one of the wonderful things about being where I am now is the years of seeing the Word of God apply itself to every conceivable kind of thing that you could expect or not expect and realizing that the Word of God is adequate and it can bring the right answers even in a complicated time like this. But I, but I think beyond that, um, the amazing reality of my life now is what it's like to pastor a church that you've been in for half a century and see the work of the Word. Okay, so I'm, I'm um, pastoring the great-grandchildren, in some cases, of people who were in our church. A uh, number of cases, and I've seen the Word of God do its work generationally through these families. 
I'm, I'm living a kind of life that very few pastors will ever know, where you build a loving relationship with a core of people and it lasts for half a century. The, the prayer support I get, the, the love, the affection, the trust, the care uh, is, is really amazing. And it's, it's not just that I'm a teacher, it's that there's a shepherd and sheep relationship that's very intimate over this long. You mentioned weddings and funerals and hospital calls and people's issues in life, and you've been there and gone through all of that. So there's a bond of love and affection that most men will never know because they're not going to be in one place for half a century. Um, and it's, it's a bond that the, that the Holy Spirit creates because I'm the messenger of the Word of God. You know, Paul says, quoting from Isaiah, how blessed are the feet of those who preach the good news. Well, I know what it's like to receive the blessing because I've been the guy preaching the truth. I'm not the source of it, but I've been the I've been the tool that God used, and and the bond of love and affection um, is is beyond description. Mm -hmm. That's really encouraging. Uh, Phil Johnson said of you, he said that uh, you are the greatest American expositor in the last 200 years, and so you've spent your ministry preaching the Bible verse by verse. In fact, you, in, in over 42 years, you walked with your church through the entire New Testament. That's, that's about 3.7 verses per week for your entire <laughs> ministry. You did the math, huh? Yeah. And so why is it that with all of the new changes, uh, as far as methodology, that you've never departed from expository preaching? Because I have one task, and that is to proclaim the Word of God. Uh, that, that never changes. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. Um, yeah, in a sense, what's going on around me is irrelevant, except to the point that you direct these things at the seasons you're in. Uh, but the, the command is to preach the Word. In season and out of season, it's always the Word. Mm. So uh, th there's nothing that I could come up with or that I could think of or I could read from another author that would even approximate the value of divine revelation. Mm -hmm. So I think everything is driven by my view of Scripture. And um, I was talking to the Master Seminary guys a couple of days ago, and, and I told them the, the foundation of ministry, okay, the foundation of ministry is your view of Scripture. And, um, and the first and necessary aspect of that view is that you believe the Word of God is objective. To borrow from Luther, you believe it's external to you, mm -hmm. okay, so that your intuition, your experience has no role in interpreting Scripture, okay? It's external to you. It's timeless, it's eternal, but it's outside of you. So uh, you're never looking inside, you're always looking outside. So you spend your entire life trying to accurately handle the word of truth so you don't have to be ashamed, as Paul said. So, that, that sense of, uh, ob of the objective word has driven my life. And the, the second thing that's driven me is that interpreting it accurately is actually a science. It, it is actually done by rules that are fixed, grammatical, historical, contextual rules. So that this is not whimsy, this is not sentiment, this is not emotional, this is not intuitive. Th that I, 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 come to, I come to the Word of God the same way a scientist would come to a math problem or any other kind of thing. And thirdly, that produces rationality. So I have to use my mind, uh, obviously aided by the Holy Spirit. Graciously, the Lord has given us the teacher so He can teach us internally, but still, the idea that the Word of God is outside of me, that its interpretation has nothing to do with my life or my intuition, that it has to be approached scientifically, and that God has given me rational faculty so that I can determine what the meaning of the text is um, outside myself. Hmm. So because I'm so strong on the fact that that's all outside of me, um, it's something that's I don't want to say totally detached, but 
I don't bring anything personal to that effort. It's, mm. it's just how can I get what God meant to say right? Because the, the meaning is the revelation. So I think that has protected me from, uh, obviously in the process, you've got to get rid of some of your presuppositions, some of the temptations to take a verse, push it a certain direction for a personal reason. But it's that objectivity and that sense that I have to get this right. What did it mean originally? Because that's what it still means. That I think has anchored me down. And if you're going to teach the Bible, that's what you have to do. You, you have to do it. And then the, the next thing to say would be, there's so much of it that I could spend my whole life doing it and not run out of information. So why have I done this my whole life? Because it is the Word of God and because I'm trying to work my way through it as best I can, uh, and there's nothing that even compares to it. Mm -hmm. Really good. Occasionally you'll hear stories about people, and so I, I've heard different stories, rumors perhaps through the years of things that have happened in your ministry. I uh, wanted to ask you about one of those stories, if you could kind of walk us back and tell us a little bit about what happened, what was happening, the backdrop of it. but. Uh, the story was that you walked into your office on the Lord's Day and you found a man inside of your office with a sword. And he asked, right. where is John MacArthur? T tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, it was Easter Sunday. And he was in gym shorts. And um, he actually had a, kind of a spear, like a javelin. And um, he was in gym shorts and a t-shirt. And you have to go through one, two, three four door, double door sets to get to my office. And that was our, let's see, Easter Sunday morning, our first service is at seven. So this is like 6.15 on a Sunday morning. And I walk in, the security guy let me in, I walk in and he's sitting there with this, with this javelin in his hand and um, looking for John MacArthur. So I immediately knew that he had gone in there, somehow he'd gotten in the night before and he'd been there all night waiting for me to show up. And uh, yeah, it, it actually was true. And so he said, he looked kind of stunned when I stepped in. Um, and I, I said, well, you know, trying to act like I was not surprised. Uh, how can I help you? What's your name? How can I help you? He told me his name. And I said, well, why are you here? He said, well, well, and then he stumbled a little bit. And he said, uh, I have something to say to the, to the congregation. I have something to say. I, I, I want to come up and, and say what I have to say from God. I said, really? Uh, he said, yes, and it's very, very important. He was kind of stumbling a little bit. And I just acted, you know, kind of bold. And I said, well, that's, that's great. I'm glad you're going to do that. Let me go get the guy who's in charge of that. So I, I went, I stuck my head out the door and I said to the security guy, I think you need to come in. There's a guy in here with a javelin in his hand. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. And the, the guy panicked, and the security came and got him. Um, as it turned out, he had told his brother, uh, he was a mental patient, obviously, but he had told his brother that God had told him to kill me, hmm. and he had been waiting there to kill me, so that this is the bizarre part of it, that, that I could rise from the dead and even have more influence, because I was raised from the dead. But... And that was his objective, and he had told his brother that. So somehow uh, the Lord stopped him from doing that mm -hmm. that morning, and um, he backed down to just wanting to make an announcement. The sad story about the guy is it wasn't long after that he took his own life. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, that actually is a true story. That's kind of legendary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you and R.C. Sproul mm -hmm. were really good friends. And uh, uh, back during the day in the, the mid-90s, there was a controversy between uh, the, the evangelicals and Catholics together, the, the whole debacle. Mm -hmm. and, and at uh, Sproul's memorial service, you spoke and you, you talked a little bit about that whole uh, meeting that took place. So take us back to that, that meeting and tell us what happened when Sproul responded in opposition to what they were holding to their positions. Well, yeah, the, the, the back story on that is that um, R.C. had um, spent a, a lot of time with Charles Colson, trying to help him. Colson came from a Catholic background and, you know, he started prison fellowship and he got into the evangelical world and 
And um, he, he looked to R.C. to kind of mentor him, and R.C. invested a ton of time in, in Charles Colson. And then Colson signed that crazy evangelicals and, Catholic, evangelicals and Catholics Together document, which basically said we, we need to unify because we preach the same gospel. Um, and Sproul was just horrified at that. If there's anything that R.C. understood, it was the gospel and the distinctiveness of the Reformation and the difference between what Rome teaches and what Council of Trent taught and what the Bible teaches about the gospel. Uh, so he was very exercised about that. And um, it all basically led to going down to Jim Kennedy's church in Florida and um, R.C. and Jim Kennedy asked me if I would be the third guy, and I, I, I'm not sure why they chose me, but, but I said, sure. So they were there to defend the biblical doctrine of justification by faith alone. On the other side, it was a strange combination of Bill Bright from Campus Crusade, whose theology could be summed up in a booklet with eight pages, and, um, and uh, J.I. Packer, who is a formidable Anglican theologian, and, um, and Charles Colson, who was sort of somewhere between the two. So for seven hours, the debate raged about what is the gospel and what must you believe to truly be saved? At one point, I mean, it was, it was heated, for sure. There were a couple of moderators there, but it was heated. At one point, Sproul is up and got his knee on the table, and he's pointing and saying, I don't think you get it. This is, the, this is about whether you are a Christian or not. I mean, that's, that's how clear-cut this issue was on the gospel. After seven hours, um, I, I was sitting next to Jim Packer. After seven hours, I said, Jim, okay, so what does someone have to believe to be a Christian? Uh, Packer could explain the doctrine of justification. In fact, he wrote a brilliant treatment of it in the introduction to John Owen's Death of Death. Mm -hmm. So Packer knew that doctrine. What, what the debate was about, whether it was necessary to believe that doctrine to be saved. And so after seven hours, my last question to, to Jim Packer was, okay, there has to be some threshold. You have, to, you have to get to some point to be saved, to have saving faith. It has to be, it's not a contentless faith. It's, it's, it's got to have content. So at what, at what point do you believe enough of the doctrine of salvation to really be saved? And Packer said, that's a good question. Hmm. That was the last thing he said. Wow. So... There was no willingness on their part to affirm that salvation comes to those who believe the true gospel. Um, that was a hard, hard time for uh, R.C. because of the long friendship he had had with Colson, whose wife was a very, very devout Roman Catholic. Um, but yeah, and I mean, that's what that's what got R.C. and I together as kind of foxhole buddies because we would go to the mat together. Um, and, you know, at, when he was at his best in a situation like that, I, I think so many times, it's too bad there wasn't an audience because it was profound stuff. Uh, but we were both willing to fight, and that's why he nicknamed me Boris because Boris Yeltsin stood on a tank in Moscow and stopped this this movement, and he said, you're, you're Boris, he always called me Boris, and I think we had that friendship built around that common willingness to fight the battle for the truth. Mm. Um, I miss him. Uh, Stephen Nichols has finished a biography on him. Mm -hmm. It's called R.C., A Life. I just read a pre-publication copy. It, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It is incredible. Uh, I, I'm just today even running an endorsement for it. I don't know exactly when it'll be out, but... Uh, uh, yeah, and just reading through the book again reminded me of what drove him was the truth, the truth. And he would even be willing, 
He would even be willing to debate on something when I didn't think he had a case for it, like infant baptism. Um, but yeah, the, the ECT thing was a major disappointment that as far as we'd come and as much as RC had taught about this, one of the people he'd invested the most in didn't buy into it. And that was a big disappointment. So uh, sometime after that, not long after that, he produced another document that clarified the issue of salvation. Um, but that battle has, um, there's another way to understand that battle. I say the same thing about the Lordship of Christ issue. I used to write books on the Lordship of Christ and they would be argued by, by other guys who wanted to write other things. And people ask me, do you think there's still a question with the Lordship of Christ? And I say, absolutely. There are, there are denials of the Lordship of Christ everywhere. They, they just don't have words. They, they, you couldn't argue them. There's just an indifference to that kind of thing. So it's, it's sort of in the groundwater of the weakness and sippidness of evangelical theology. And it's why 50% of evangelicals think that Muslims and Jews are acceptable to God. Mm -hmm. Or a third of evangelicals think Jesus was not God. He was a created being. So, yeah, I don't think people want to argue that. But the same thing is true with the doctrine of justification by faith. That there would be a mass of people in the evangelical church who couldn't argue against it or for it because they're, they're in the marginal areas of doctrine. This suits the contemporary kind of pragmatic church. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's an epic tragedy. Mm -hmm. You're no uh, stranger to controversy. So uh, through the years, you have taken very public stands against error, and presently you find yourself in another controversy related to this whole pandemic, the, the COVID-19 controversy, and you have been applauded by many. You've been critiqued by others uh, with your willingness uh, and your choice to continue to meet as a church on the Lord's Day. So you've chosen to defy the, the mandates. So why did you make that choice? Um. Yeah, well, I like to remind people I'm not doing anything different now than I've done for 50 years. I show up in church and I preach and we sing and we worship the Lord and everybody comes. Um, look, there are only two things to think about. Um, if you go back in church history, every place you find a preacher who stood against the authorities, you make a hero out of him, right? I mean, that's church history. If you study church history... The heroes are all those guys who took issue with the powers that be, whether you're talking about Luther or Calvin or John Knox or the Puritans and, the, you know, when in the expulsion, they were all thrown out of their churches. And so it, it's been the it's been the reality through the history of the church that faithfulness to the to, to divine mandate and to the word of God has resulted in conflict with earthly authorities. And as we go back in church history and find those locations, we have always made heroes out of those men who stood against the government intruding on the church. Now, that's just what's happening today. The government says, shut your church down. And my initial response is, well, wait a minute. We, we would never do that. that. We wouldn't think of doing that unless there was some compelling reason. So we were told at the beginning that millions were going to die, right? Millions mm -hmm. of people are going to die from COVID. And um, I mean, just simply stated, we don't want to kill millions of people. So I said, fine, let's, uh, let's just do live stream. And I, I preached to an empty auditorium for three, four weeks. And then uh, all of a sudden people started coming. They, we didn't say anything. We didn't announce anything. We, we we didn't do anything, and they started to come because it was becoming crystal clear that, that the narrative was not true. It was not true. Every single week, that has become more clear and more clear and more clear. And uh, it's unfortunate that uh, a lot of people don't know the reality, so I've tried to help people with that. Now we have um, seven, 8,000 people there on a Sunday. They fill up the worship center. They fill up the family center. They fill up a tent. They fill up other rooms in the classroom building, they're all over the place. And uh, there are no social distancing, no masks, and, and nobody that we know is sick. We had, we had one couple um, in March that you know, got that COVID, and then we knew of one other guy in our church and maybe another person who was tested positive. But we haven't had any outbreak of anything. 
And it, it's not that the church is the proof of that. It's the church is the reflection of the fact that it's being proven all through society. People aren't sick. Our, our people are not sick. So they just keep coming to church and coming to church. And um, it's, it's been an incredible joy. So the only thing that, that I said at the beginning was, the church needs to be the church unless there is some kind of deadly thing loose. If we determine that that's not true, then we need to be the church. Uh, in California, you have one one hundredth of one percent chance of getting COVID. If you get COVID, this is in the court. This was presented to the court that we were in a week ago. In California, if you live in California, you have one chance in 19.1 million that you're going to die from COVID. If you're over 50, if you're under 50, you have no chance. So what in the world is going on? Uh, once we realize, and, and we got to be truthful with people. And, and that means, that, you know, that's part of preaching in the season. We, we, as a pastor, I've got to teach my people the word of God, but I need to be, I need to be, navigating the world around them to protect them if they need protection, uh, but to tell them the truth if they're being lied to. And, and our people know that they have been lied to over and over and over and over. And they, the masks um, is so foolish. M most doctors would tell you it's not going to help you to wear a bacterial zoo in front of your face. Uh, that, that makes no sense. So once our people realize that there was no real danger here. Um, and even the, even the local people in the health department, we've heard amazing testimonies that even I heard from uh, one of the employees, 90% of the health department is disgusted the way they're handling Grace Church. Yeah. So they know things that, you know, the public doesn't know. It's unfortunate. So, um, but, but the fallout of that has been that people whose churches closed down uh, are, are pouring into our church, and we're, we're just being overwhelmed with people, and it's wonderful. And all of a sudden, just having a church service, singing hymns, hearing the Word of God, fellowshipping, uh, has taken on a completely new meaning. And I think because there's a sense that something is happening in our country that's not going to get fixed. And it's one thing when there's a trend and it goes away, or even 9-11, was there and it was done and life got back to normal. For a lot of people, this feels like the end of things as they've always known them. And so there's a kind of eschatological kind of angst about this. There's, there's a fear that, that never, it's never going to be right again, that the forces are just too massive, too overwhelming. If you can, if you can lock down an entire nation and destroy people, destroy them, and then lock down the world and destroy people all over the world. And even with multiple millions of people negatively affected and even dying because of the lockdown, they still don't lift the lockdown. People know that there are forces in control of their world and their lives that are frightening to them, more frightening than anything they've ever known in anything in my life. And so there's a sense that they want to hear from God they want to go to a place that's safe, that's trustworthy, that explains reality to them and helps them navigate this. So it's been an explosive time for our church. Mm -hmm. And we, we didn't have children for weeks and weeks. The Sunday we opened up children's ministry, there were a thousand children that showed up. We had balloons all over campus and, and uh, there were a hundred, I think they counted over a hundred children signed in who had never been to our church. So. Uh, that, that reflects the, the fact that families are concerned about their kids and mm -hmm. their grandkids. So, um, yeah, we are at a point now where um, there are doctors and epidemiologists contacting us all the time saying, we would like to testify on your behalf in court. I, I got a letter from one a couple of days ago saying, um, there are many who believe that the testing is 90% unreliable. So what is that going to do, that a vaccine is not going to do anything? We've never had a vaccine that got uh, guaranteed effects to more than 30% of the population. So the, all this is floating around. We don't major on that, but uh, because our people have been meeting long enough now and nothing has happened, that they're not worried about it. But at first, I tried to help them understand some of those things. Yeah, really good. Back in 2018, 
uh, we assembled a group of us did at Herb's House Coffee in mm -hmm. Dallas. And the purpose of that meeting was to diagnose, talk about, think through some of the issues related to the social justice movement within evangelicalism. Now, back in 2018, which is just two years ago, um, most evangelical leaders were, were saying to us, there is no such thing as a social justice agenda in evangelicalism. We were heavily critiqued. The day that we gathered, it was your 79th birthday. We sat at the table. We spent an entire day working through the issues together. And then what emerged from that meeting was the statement on social justice mm -hmm. and the gospel. And here we are uh, just two years later, and we see massive issues taking place related to social justice culturally and within evangelical circles. But in that meeting, after I opened up the meeting, talked about some initial things to get the ball rolling, you made a statement. You said that this social justice agenda is more dangerous than any other controversy that you've faced, perhaps the most dangerous in the last maybe 100 years, but definitely in your lifetime. Do you still believe that to be the no, case? There's no question about it. There's no question about it. Um, I think it was Noam Chomsky who said, if you want to start a revolution, come up with a slogan that nobody can reject. Mm. Social justice, who would reject that? Mm. Black Lives Matter, who would reject that? So the, the, the camel's nose is in the tent at that mm. point. Because the, and, and then you don't want to be a racist. And you have to realize that people have been mistreated in the past. And so all of that is framed up. And what, what this was so disturbing to me, and that's why I was part of that meeting, and that's why I think that statement is so well done. What was so concerning to me was people were jumping on that bandwagon before they really thought what they were getting into. Because um, in the first place, I've said this through the years, justice doesn't need an adjective. Justice is justice. Um, social justice is another term for socialism. It's another term for taking money from one person and handing it to another one. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's, it's basically a euphemism for equality of outcome. You can have equality of opportunity, but you can't guarantee equality of outcome. But social justice wants to guarantee equality of outcome by taking away something that this person has earned and handing it to someone who didn't earn it. Mm -hmm. So it was just a front for socialism. Um, there, there were years and years of underlying, underbelly developments um, to tear down democracy as we know it in America underneath that, and I, I, I saw that for whatever reason. Critical race theory, like all critical theory is iconoclastic, all it wants to do is destroy, destroy, destroy. And there's a simple way to understand that, okay? Um, he, here's what I saw coming. Um, we are, as white people, or non-African um, American people, the culprits in everything that's wrong in this society. And um, the people who are suffering are suffering because we've done them wrong systemically. So th this pushing this a little further, there's a guy named James Lindsay who's an atheist. Pretty remarkable insights for an atheist. He sees a lot of things that evangelical leaders don't see. L Lindsay says, here's the bottom line, and he's an evolutionist. He's saying, the, the, the notion here is this, that human beings come into the world as a blank slate. They have no innate characteristics and they have no, um, no unchanging, immutable characteristics, okay? And, and even gender, okay? You come in as a blank slate, you're the only being in the evolutionary chain that has no immutable, innate characteristic. You're just a blank slate. And so the culture will frame you. It'll tell you what gender is acceptable, what behavior is acceptable, and so forth. So the, the idea is strikes a blow against God as creator, creating us in his own image. There are we bear the mark of God, and those are immutable characteristics. And he created the male and female, and that too is immutable. But we can see in the transgender movement that that one has to be attacked overtly because it's so stupid. Um, so if you believe that everybody comes in as this, this blank slate, uh, I read a story about a woman who had a baby 
um, girl, but she didn't want the child to be influenced as to gender, so one week she gave the child trucks, and the next week she gave the child dolls, and then trucks and dolls, and came back after a few weeks and found the dresses on the trucks. So this is the insanity that comes out of the chaos of confusion there. But that is the notion, so that, the purpose in that is so that I'm not responsible for what I've become. You are because you patriarchal white people uh, systemically built into the fabric of this culture the kind of things that made me what I am. So I'm not, I'm not, it's not my fault. So what do we have to do? Not change things. We, we can't just change things because you're still in power. We have to burn this thing down to the ground and replace that with a completely different group of um, people. Hmm. So that's when you look at social justice, systemic racism, critical race theory, it is a, a, an effort to completely abolish everything we've known as life. One of the most interesting aspects of it is what's called research justice. I don't know if you've heard that. Mm -hmm. Research justice means if you're a white guy in a university, your research is unacceptable. You're on the outside. So if you take out the research of the white guy or the Asian guy, you blunt progress. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's absurdity, but that's how iconoclastic it is. That's how devastating it is, and that's why it's a burn down deal. It wants to burn down, uh, it wants to end uh, capitalism, private enterprise, like the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, it, it wants to go back down to nothing. It doesn't have to rebuild because w when there's a flip and new power structure comes, they'll rebuild it the way they want. So how in the world evangelicals could buy into that and get seduced by feeling guilty for being white as if they mistreated people is just bizarre. Um, have, have, uh, has everybody been treated the way they should be treated in the world? No. Has anybody been treated the way they should be treated in the world from a divine standpoint? Well, not yet because we're still alive and we, we're sinners enough we, we should have been judged long ago. But just on a human level, um, the, the one thing the sinner wants to do is blame somebody else for his sin. Mm -hmm. And so when I started to attack this, I went through a series on Ezekiel 18 of individual responsibility. If we tell people they're not responsible for what they are, you just cut them off from the Savior. Because, you know, if I don't take, come to grips with my own wretchedness, and that's a challenge anyway. Jesus said they hate me because I tell them their deeds are evil. So this aids and abet the sinner's pride. Mm -hmm that I'm a victim, not a criminal, not a perpetrator. Um, and I think people bought into it because they didn't want to be called a racist instead of responding biblically. And now that was a trap. That was a complete setup. Mm -hmm. Once you decided to buy into it and you start confessing your whiteness, whatever in the world, that ridiculous. If you're going to confess, confess something you really are guilty of. But that kind of virtue signaling, kind of right. spiritual grandstanding is absolutely meaningless and it just aids and abets the notion that people are what they are because of somebody else. And you take a look at the African American community and I've, I've been involved in it as, as mm -hmm. many people know and uh, have a lot of experience. But if you're an illegitimate child, mm -hmm. if you're mother has aborted other children, if you have no father in the home, um, and you're growing up in a society of kids just running wild in the streets, um, if you're, uh, you'd hate to say this, but in Los Angeles, the level of illiteracy in the public schools is mind-boggling. What chance do you have? Now, you, you can't blame someone else for that. That, that culture needs to grip, get a grip on itself. And so as a Christian, what I want to say is stop blaming someone else. Look, everybody's got issues in life. Um, take, take a look at where you are. Find the path to change that. Um, and the, the change begins when you come to Christ. And so I, I just think this, this has ripped this country to ribbons, and it's just destroying churches. And you know it's destroying denominations. Mm -hmm. And it never should do that. Um, 
but it, that's what it's done because no one wants to be called a racist. Mm -hmm. now, you, you want to avoid that at all costs. But I think there are other ways that you can prove you have the heart of God who is no respecter of persons. Yeah. Racism or any kind of partiality is a sin. It, it's clearly a sin and it's a bizarre sin to hate people because of some immutable characteristics about them, whether it's you hate because they're black or you hate because they're Asians or you hate because they're white, um, that, that's, that's insanity. Why would you reduce everybody to that? But that's what's been done. In order to aid and abet the cause, they have to reduce everybody to an identity class, and then everybody in that identity class has to receive the same amount of hate. Hmm. And then they have to bear the same amount of guilt, then they have to make this endless confession I, I watched this play out with uh, Drew Brees, the quarterback at, in New Orleans, who made a very sensible statement and then couldn't repent enough. He just kept repenting and repenting and repenting. It was never enough. That's right. So this is, um, th this is the most destructive thing that I've ever seen happen to the evangelical movement. And the big question is, are these guys who got on the wrong side of this ever going to say, I was wrong? Mm -hmm. uh, I need to repent, not of being white, I need to repent of being woke. Yeah. I need to repent of joining Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. I need to repent of being an aide and a bet to Antifa. I need to repent of hating the police and wanting to defund an institution that God has ordained for the protection and preservation of life. And Romans 13 says they're ministers of God. Mm -hmm. If they want to repent of something, what I would like to see and what would make a massive difference in this nation would be evangelical leaders repenting of siding with such a destructive movement. Uh, I, I can hope for that. Next year in 2021 in Atlanta, we're going to gather together as, as uh, attendees and speakers for the G3 National Conference on the Doctrine of Christ. Now, as, as you well know, uh, the Doctrine of Christ is extremely important. Uh, many heresies flow out of this idea of a misguided view of Jesus, or they just completely outright deny the deity of Christ. But beyond the heretical aspects, the need for Christian preachers to preach Christ week by week, um, talk to us a little bit about the importance of the doctrine of Christ. Well, there's, there's no more important doctrine than the doctrine of Christ. I think when these surveys show that that one-third of evangelicals don't believe Jesus was God, it isn't that they have been convinced that He isn't God. They just never thought about it because it never comes up, because it's never preached. If, if you're pre preaching Jesus and never defining that He is God, don't blame the guy in the pew if he doesn't figure it out, if you're not clear enough. So I, I, don't, I don't think there's a movement in evangelicalism to assault the deity of Christ, or to generalize salvation and say Muslims and Jews and all good people are going to heaven. I, I don't think people have come to that as a mental conviction. I just think their, their water is so muddy that what they're hearing in church is so undefined, so nebulous, sentimental preaching, talk about Jesus, uh, using God words and all of that without defining absolutely anything mm -hmm. has yielded this kind of thing so that a person could actually classify himself as an evangelical and be a full-blown heretic mm. because there are never enough definitions of anything. So in calling for clarity on the person of Christ, we're at the very heart of absolutely everything. What we need to call churches to do is to preach Christ definitively, not sentimentally, mm -hmm. uh, not in shallow, superficial ways. So again, teaching sound doctrine, right? Um, but we have to get our Christology right. If you don't get your Christology right, you know, the Apostle John pronounces a curse. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you must have the right, the true Christ. Cults consciously, overtly, manifestly, satanically teach against the deity of Christ. Evangelicals just 
talk about Jesus. They don't, not sure who he is. Talk about God, casual, casual, a casual view of God would define evangelicalism. Um, R.C. Sproul made much of the issue that whenever ever he was asked what is the greatest need in the evangelical movement, he would say the nature, to know the nature of God, mm. uh, to know the nature of the triune God fully, and that was his, that was his, uh, his pinnacle point throughout his whole ministry. So again, the utter absence of any sound theology it makes people vulnerable. And then when you suck them into something like social justice and all of that, they don't think critically, they don't think doctrinally. They just get washed up in the sentimental riffraff that comes on shore. Uh, until there's sound doctrine and clear exposition of Scripture, there's going to be confusion on all these things. Mm -hmm. So, but, but a great place to start thinking critically and clearly is about the person of Christ. Couldn't have a better subject. Yeah. You're one of my heroes in the faith, and it's been a privilege to uh, interact with you personally uh, over these last few years. And then, of course, uh, to be able to partner with, with your ministry has been a, a huge encouragement to me. We are living in a day of uh, a shortage of faithful men. And one of the things that we're passionate about at G3 is encouraging faithful men to stand in the pulpit and to preach the Word of God faithfully. And I know that that's at the heart of your ministry as well. So that's what excites G3 uh, as far as partnership with your ministry. What excites you about partnering with G3? Well, I mean, I'm thankful for you because you're a faithful guy and there are a lot of them out there and I think they need a rallying point. Um, there's just um, a shift in the sort of evangelical mega conference world away from clarity, biblical clarity, biblical conviction. It's all gotten caught up in um, SSA, same-sex attraction not being a sin, or racial social justice, or, and it's, it's, it's swirling around in circles that, that have nothing to do with the heart and soul of why the church is in the world. So they're, they're busy rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, and it's going down anyway. So how they could be so distracted is a tragedy. But th there's a need for an, a new conference, a new gathering of people who want to go to the heart and soul of the evangelical Christian cause, and that is to sound doctrine. Amen. Um, and the time is right. Hmm. Yeah, I, I was there um, a year ago. Mm -hmm and could see the, the sense of uh, fulfillment that you guys were experiencing and, and could see that this is a gathering of people who aren't minimally connected, but they're more maximally connected to sound doctrine, I would say. Yeah. I mean, if you're just saying the, the gospel connects us, that, that's, that's a little bit fragile because of so many other issues. The people at um, a G3 uh, take their doctrine through more categories. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's, that's a great thing. And I think the time is right for that, and we're, we're glad to be a part. Amen. In 100 years, when a seminary student sits down at his desk, opens his computer, whatever that looks like at the time, and Googles or searches the name John MacArthur, what do you want him to know about you? <laughs> well, I, I think uh, just that, you know, I taught the, the, the Bible, taught the Word of God. Uh, that, that's the only thing that I would... Um, I'm, my legacy is there. It's not, it's not important. Um, the personal part is not important other than to undergird the integrity of your preaching, you know, as a pastor. But I, I think this, just the, what I've taught is there, and that was my life, and that's the contribution I made for... Um, for whatever use the Lord would have it have in the future, I'm, I'm deeply grateful. And I, from the very beginning, I realized that I didn't want my sermons locked into a zip code or a timestamp. Um, and I think the Word of God is timeless, so I'm grateful that there's a kind of timelessness. The only way you know the difference between a new sermon of mine and one from 40 years ago is I'm talking a little faster and my voice sounds a little higher. So. I guess the, there's nothing, there's no question to ask really. The legacy will be the, 
the teaching that's there in books and um, audio. Hmm. So. Dr. McArthur, thank you for joining us for this edition of the G3 Podcast. My pleasure. Thank right. you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.